This week on Only in America, despite the government reopening, the identity crisis still fuels the drama on Capitol Hill. It's not a normal economic era. It's not a peace and war era. It's an identity era. And even if something as silly as the government shut down revolves around fundamental issues of race and identity. Despite his shifting positions on immigration, is President Trump right back where he started? They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. And from Bend, Oregon, the Christian movement helping to mend the divide. These are like your your Anglo Sunday morning church people standing in the streets of Bend during lunch hour on a Wednesday yeah. with signs saying, we are for our dreamers, our dreamers are our future, mm-hmm. right? And they're not just saying that because of the education and awareness, they're saying that because they're now in relationship with these young heroes. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Narani with Only in America. On June 16, 2015, less than 200 words into the speech announcing his presidential run, Donald Trump launched into a diatribe against Mexico and immigration. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. It only makes common sense. They're sending us not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. On January 20th, 2018, After exactly one year as president and in the middle of a debate regarding Dreamers, President Trump released an ad that accused Democrats of being, quote, complicit in every way with murders committed by illegal immigrants. In between, the president has talked about a bill of love for DACA recipients and even a second phase of legislation looking at broader reforms. And according to reports, as late as last Friday, he seemed to be leaning towards a bipartisan compromise. Look. I understand that if you are a Trump voter, this is what you signed up for. He has disrupted. He has made changes conservatives have long desired. But as David Brooks put it on PBS's NewsHour, this is now playing out in an identity era. The, the Democrats have said, we can pin the tr- Trump racism. That's where we're going to run on. And, and the Republicans have said, we're going to pin American identity versus the aliens. That's where we're going to run on. It shows what a different era this is. It's not a normal economic era. It's not a peace and war era. It's an identity era. And even if something as silly as the government shut down revolves around fundamental issues of race and identity. Now, while I don't think demographics are destiny, particularly in conservative parts of the country, As I wrote for Friday's Boston Globe, I do believe the majority of Americans are welcoming people who want to live in a nation of laws and a nation of grace. Having yet again kicked the DACA can down the road, leaving dreamers in further limbo, I hope our nation's leaders can find a graceful exit to this stalemate, because the question of the dreamers is shaping the contours of 2018 and 2020 elections. And the way this is going, the identity era is going to be ugly. This is what I know for sure. Senator Graham did yeoman's work getting to a compromise. He, Senator Flake, and other moderates from both sides of the aisle got their steps in this week as they shuttled between offices to broker a solution. The Democrats are ready to give Trump the wall. Both Senator Schumer and Congressman Gutierrez have publicly said as much. And remember, this was the president's original and loudest demand. But President Trump, along with Majority Leader Senator McConnell and Speaker Ryan, have been compromised by immigration hardliners. Senator Cotton, Chief of Staff John Kelly, and Stephen Miller are all working to torpedo a deal at every chance they get. And they're assisted by Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte and others with the Securing America's Future Act. In fact, within Thursday night's House spending deal, Freedom Caucus Chairman Mark Meadows exacted a commitment from Speaker Ryan to consider Goodlatte's bill in the weeks ahead. So let's spend an extra minute here since the Goodlatte bill is really an existential threat to immigration. In a blog post last week, 
David Beer of the Gato Institute points out that while authors claim the Goodlatte bill would cut immigration by 25%, in reality, the legislation would be closer to almost a 40% decline in legal immigration. Beer points out that this would be the largest policy-driven reduction in legal immigration since the awful, racially motivated acts of the 1920s. As the National Foundation for American Policy's Stuart Anderson told CNN's Ron Brownstein last week, the purpose of this from the beginning has been to cut legal immigration. So where are we now? Monday afternoon, the House and Senate passed a three-week continuing resolution that included an agreement for both chambers to take up standalone immigration legislation to address dreamers. Let me be really clear here. This is going to be a brutal process leading to an epic battle. And over the years, every time we have faced this standalone legislative process, where a bill is independent of a must-pass piece of legislation such as the budget, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives has failed to muster a victory. And this time, the run-up to a standalone vote will include the January 30th State of the Union speech, the speech where, I anticipate, Chief of Staff John Kelly, Stephen Miller, Senator Cotton, and others will drive an anti-immigrant narrative through the president's teleprompter. This will all make the last 72 hours look quaint. But Trump, Ryan, and McConnell can be successful if they do three things. One, marginalize hardliner anti-immigrant forces such as Stephen Miller so they just are not in the room. Two, create bipartisan coalitions that can get to 218 votes in the House and to 60 votes in the Senate. And three, act with urgency. If they do these three things, Trump, McConnell, and Ryan will do something historic. The question is, do they want to make history and pass immigration reform, or do they want a status quo of increased deportations? It's going to be an interesting few weeks. I'm Ali Nirani. Coming up, an evangelical perspective on immigration aimed at mending the divide. You know, the the tradition of American Christians is not that of peacemakers. Mm -hmm. It's not that of people who actively move into the divide to see it mended. It it tends to be a group of people who have a particular agenda, who endorse revenge, who are okay with the use of violence. Regardless of what that does, the main objective seems to be our own safety, maybe our own sense of morality, and then we're going to go to be be in heaven with Jesus the rest of our life. That's just not Christian faithfulness and theologically it's inaccurate. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. This is Only in America. I'm Ali Nirani. When you think of Bend, Oregon, you might think of a place which is kind of isolated between the Cascade Mountains to the west and vast forest lands to the east and south. But Bend is the seventh fastest growing city in the U.S. It's also home to Jer Swigert, co-founder of a movement called the Global Immersion Project. The project aims to cultivate peacemakers by giving people access to understand global and domestic conflicts from the perspective of their own neighborhoods. Jer was in D.C. recently where he told me more about how it relates to the immigration debate and how it all started. We began to take peace and peacemaking very seriously and then began to ask questions like why, uh, why has the church not taken peace and restoration seriously? Why is it that the U.S. American church has never been understood as an instrument of peace in the world? Why is it that we seem to endorse and perpetuate revenge more than reconciliation? And then we got to peacemaking and uh, who are peacemakers? Are they born or are they formed? And if we could form them, how would we do it? And, and those questions really served as the genesis of global immersion. And 
and for the last several years, we've been working on different kinds of training initiatives to bring peace to life theologically and practically in the life of the, the U.S. American church. So we've worked together you know, with the National Immigration Forum and the Global Immersion Project in helping pastors, church leaders understand the U.S.-Mexico border. And while I haven't had a chance to make one of these trips yet, every person that I've talked to that has had that experience leaves a, a changed person, not just by the experience of visiting the border, but also being able to visit and learn about the border within the framework of their faith. So describe a little bit how you how you came to that idea of, of really seeing the border of a place where, you know, it's a place for peace and restoration uh, and what you see as like a successful visit. Yeah, good. I We really believe that if you want to learn about peace, go to conflict, go to where it's broken, go to the pain. But also go and learn from the peacemakers embedded in that. And uh, and in the border reality, you have dynamic women and men on both sides of the border who at high, the highest cost to themselves are uh, invested in the restoration of image bearers of God. And so we think that the most powerful training uh, involves immersion. We have to intentionally displace ourselves, especially dominant culture folk. Uh, dominant culture faith leaders who um, have never found themselves in points close enough to pain to actually lament and then let that become the fuel for just solutions. And so in in our border immersion, we spend 50% of our time in San Diego, 50% of our time in Tijuana. Um, we're meeting with anybody from uh, from border patrol and, uh, and conservative faith leaders to college professors, to law enforcement officials in San Diego, to, um, to activists in, in San Diego, to the, the women and men who are who are facilitating the recovery and resourcing uh, people who are on the move either from the south, north, because of the violence of the drug cartels in Central America and and Southern Mexico, to migration from the north, south, people who are being deported from our country and and find themselves ripped away from their families and now in a city that they've never been in before. And so we get people close and personal with the human reality of this, uh, help them reflect on it theologically, but when you when you introduce that human touch, here's what it accomplishes. It, it moves immigration from a politically polarizing reality to a deeply human one, and we happen to be of a tradition that demands hospitality. That hospitality to to foreigners is actually a defining mark of our faith. And so um, when you're face to face with women and children and men who are on the move either from the south or the north and you hear their stories and you allow them to teach us how to follow Jesus into the future in ways that actually impact them positively, it's a game changer. Mm Uh, and so our team, uh, our, our staff curate that journey. Um, we help people actually learn along the way, and then we do about 10 months of integrative coaching on the flip side of yeah, the trip. I was, I was wondering, yeah. yeah, so that we can help people actually integrate this stuff into their everyday life and leadership. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the pressing question is, okay, in light of this experience, how do you live, love, and lead in a place like Bend, Oregon, or Philadelphia, or rural Wisconsin, or Phoenix, Arizona, or wherever you're from? Because, I mean, that experience in Tijuana or in San Diego, a person is able to connect and relate to that experience to the, to the people they meet but when they go back to Bend Oregon or right. rural Wisconsin they're faced with a congregation or a community that number one obviously hasn't had that experience or those conversations but number two I mean they're driven by a fear yeah and that fear is security economic it's cultural so I mean th- those 10 months of coaching what does that look like yeah yeah so I mean I, if we're dealing with faith leaders, we're working. We're going to start by working theologically. How do you frame your experience theologically in a way that you can actually teach your community about the reality of our migrant God who commissions a migrant people with a migrant gospel to live, love, and lead in, in a migrant world, right? And so when we're talking with churches, we have to start biblically and help them understand that there's actually a biblical theological framework for why we should show up, why we should care. Secondly, when you're in Tijuana and you meet Ingrid, who has been on the run for her life with her three kids for three years because they tried to extort her, actually killed her husband, and said that they would do the same to her kids if they didn't give her, you know, give $15,000 or whatever per kid. Mm -hmm. When you meet her and you hear her story, you begin to recognize that migrants are not criminals. They're not dangerous. They're, they're not a drain on the system. They are women and men and children who, for whatever reason, are on a move, oftentimes for the sake of survival. That begins to connect with the migrants who are living in all of our neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. That's how immigration touches all of us, is that this is a phenomenon that is in 
all of our neighborhoods. And so if I'm teaching faith leaders how to be in touch and develop relationships with migrants in this immersion, then my next step is how do I, how do I reinforce that practice of immersing into the lives of the migrants in your own neighborhood, teaching them how to actually do that, but then inviting these faith leaders to bring other people into that story. Not to serve them, mm -hmm. but I think to be found informed by God in relationship with them. And so we're, we're training people how to build those kinds of relationships, how to begin to move relationships into alliances that actually begin to co-create just solutions in their own cities or in their, their own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So. I got two questions. One is, what do the solutions look like? And then second, and this is probably a bigger question of, I mean, I think most people see the immigration debate, you know, not just as a question of culture and values, but they actually see it in a global context. And I know for us as, you know, a U.S.-based domestic immigration advocacy organization, we've done a really poor job of helping people understand what does migration look like in this global context. Like our talking points end at the border. Mm -hmm. You know, they're two different questions, right? So what does the solution look like? But then it feels like what you're doing is also helping people understand, okay, why is that family fleeing Central America? And addressing it through a very specific cultural framework. That's right. So I think, it, like, I'll, I'll use Bend, Oregon as the example. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my neighborhood. And so, first of all, I, I think there's there's been this unique phenomenon uh, among dominant culture leaders where we find ourselves in rooms with whiteboards and we think that we're going to generate the solutions for the problems or the plight of the migrants in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Turns out the solutions to their injustice have been germinating in their souls for generations. And, uh, and so when, when I'm talking about local solutions, first and foremost, we have to figure out how to simply love our neighbors. And if we're going to love our neighbors, we need to get to know our neighbors. And, um, and so uh, for us in, in Central Oregon, it literally begins with finding ways to share tables, to intersect lives, to begin to mend the divide between the Anglo community and the Latino community because trust has been severed uh, in, in Central Oregon. Once we find ourselves around tables, we're finding ways to actually share our lives with each other so when we're when we're doing shared shared table projects it's not a get to know a dreamer get to know an immigrant get to know a white ally it's how do we share our lives with each other and actually grow authentic relationships and then it's in the context of those relationships where our migrant brothers and sisters become our guides for the journey. Mm -hmm. So we're actually learning about the system from their perspective, which is usually an, uh, a from a from beneath perspective, which is different f than our like l understanding immigration or their plight from from the top down. Um, and so once you start to learn from the bottom up, you begin to recognize that there are there are questions about transportation, there are questions about education, there are questions about mentorship, there are questions about language, there's question about documentation status and resources to those things. There are questions about why within our city um, are the uh, are the power brokers just wealthy white men. If we're going to have a conversation in a city like Bend or, or, or wherever, um, whatever city in the country, about the livability or the future of our city, why are we not finding migrants around that table as well who are oftentimes more committed to the benefit of the city than um, than our maybe wealthy white consumer is, mm -hmm. you know. And so solutions look like making sure the right people are around the right tables at all of the in all of these conversations such that they're contributing as equals, not just as giving you know, perspective or, or insight. We're learning all sorts of stuff about, about the actual needs of the migrants in our community. And oftentimes, rather than solving for or contending for, we're contending with to actually mm -hmm. generate some unique solutions that look like partnerships in, in Bend. And, so, and that does, it looks like partnerships between faith communities and, um, and local schools. It looks like partnerships between Anglo allies and, um, and undergrad students. It looks like apprenticeships. It looks like literally accompanying people to court, uh, you know, to court hearings or to ICE hearings or um, or even helping people get to work, creating jobs. One of the things we're doing in Bend is trying to figure out how we how people, privileged folk, leverage their hiring capacity mm -hmm. to ensure stable jobs for uh, for people in um, in our city. Or we're creating a, a, a migrant entrepreneur directory so that people understand 
all of the innovation that's happening because of the migrant community in in Bend, yeah. um, and how you can actually start to tap into that. Mm-hmm. You know, so those are those are some of the things, mm-hmm. and it's beginning to distribute wealth, and it's mm-hmm. gonna it's making economic you know differences in in the lives of and our these migrant are, families. By and large, inspired by the trip somebody takes to the border. Exactly, yep. because they're they're coming to the border, meeting these people. We're thinking about these kinds of collaborations and ways mm-hmm. of contending in the border in this unique classroom of our learning lab. And then we're sending them back into their neighborhood, moving them into relationships where these kinds of solutions begin to be generated. So you and your, your colleague, uh, John Huckins, wrote a book that came out this September, Mending the Divide, Creative Love in a Conflicted World. So you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we, we got started, but as you were writing it, you felt like the world was becoming more conflicted. Describe not just the book, but the process of getting to the place of saying, okay, let's do this. And you know, lo and behold... Um, the timing worked out. The message for Mending the Divides, it, it's something that John and I have been writing for a number of years mm-hmm. and um, and refining and now beginning to build out the muscle of it through real stories, people living out this message. For us, we just got to a place where organizationally, it seemed really important to get this message into the covers of a book to make it more accessible. You can, you can pay money to come with us into one of our immersions this uh, to, to take that message and put it into a book just simply makes it accessible and scalable. Mm-hmm. And so we wanted to we wanted to scale the impact. Um, and so we really sought to capture this message, which, which is both deeply theological but also hyper practical. And um, and as we were writing it, we just literally watched. I mean, we've been writing it for uh, we wrote for a year, and in that year, this became one of the most politically divisive moments in our time. We began to understand the divides between urban and rural, between rich and poor, between educated and uneducated. I mean, name the divide. Mm-hmm. It, throughout this political season, we saw all. I think all the band aids were ripped off the divides. And now we were able to see very clearly, I think more clearly than ever in my lifetime, that these divides have not gone away, uh, that they exist. And now we're all in our echo chambers agreeing with ourselves. And uh, and so um, so as we're writing, we're watching all of this happen and recognizing this book is a, it's a moment in time kind of book because I think everybody is really convinced, regardless of what side of a pol- the political spectrum you're on or whatever your faith tradition is or whatever it is, I think people are aware that the world is more divided right now than it's been in a long time or at least in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also think people are watching the world blow up on their smartphones, um, asking questions like, how does my faith intersect with the brokenness? Yeah. And if it doesn't, is my faith worth anything? Mm-hmm. And um, and we kept hearing that question over and over and over again. And, and the the message of our book is that, especially from a Christian tradition, we've been saved into an adventure that is a great participation with God in the restoration of broken things and the mending of divides. Mm-hmm. That that's actually Christian faithfulness to preserve our safety or our independence or our homogeneity is actually anti our faith. And so this this book is a great invitation into Christian faithfulness, which looks like moving toward the points of pain in the world and joining God in its repair. Do you think there it's a divide or it's a cut? And I, I you know, because I'm struck by the, the term Band-Aid, right? Um, you rip off a Band-Aid from it. I, and I ask the question because, you know, we'll talk to folks on either side of the political spectrum, right? You know, far left or far right. And you're right, there is this sense of... Um, Everybody says the same thing. It's like, I wish we weren't so divided. And then they'll say something very divisive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I kind of ask the question, I, use, I think of the term cut because I feel like then there's a sense of healing. Whereas divide, um, it almost feels like it's, it's harder. Um, yeah, I was just struck by the term band-aid, yeah, right? I like that. I, yeah. I really appreciate the question. Um, not to not to tell you to put a new title. Yeah, I know. Book, right? I know. I know. At the end of this conversation, we we may opt to retitle our book. Um, here, here's what we think. Oftentimes, yeah. uh, peacemakers are referred to as bridge builders. Yeah. And uh, we really fight against that. We disagree with that. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, because when when you're when you when you bridge a divide. Uh, it doesn't bring the two land masses closer together. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives access from one side to another, and so I can go over to the other side and tour it and be with people over there, but I'm going to probably return back yeah. at home. And it keeps us separate from one another. Uh, when we talk about the work of peacemaking, we actually talk about eliminating the expanse. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, if you, you, you think... 
you think about something like like the Grand Canyon, or, yeah. or 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 if you think about a crack in the in in the earth because of something violent like an earthquake. Mm-hmm. Conflict is is a violent earthquake that that creates a divide. Yeah, you know, so something drastic has occurred in order to, for a divide to actually be formed. Mm-hmm. The question is not how do we span that divide. Uh, and in so doing, keep these land masses or these people separate from one another. It's how do we eliminate the expanse and, and experience a new kind of oneness? Yep. Uh, you know, a, a, a larger repair than access that you get when you, when you bridge something. And, and Christian tradition provides that oppor- that opportunity, the ability to to again heal that divide. I think. <laughs> If you look at the work of God in Jesus from our from from a Christian perspective, mm-hmm. um, the cross is a tool of restoration, and I think Christian faithfulness understands God as a cross wearing God rather than a cross wielding God. This is the work in front of the Global Immersion Project. Is it seems as though American Christianity is more shaped by a cross wielding God. Um, a cross-wielding God does nothing but expand the divide mm-hmm. rather than eliminate it, and and so we're in in our book and in the in the work that Global Immersion is doing, we're we're calling upon American Christians to do the theological renovation to recognize that God is a peacemaker, uh, most clearly noted in the cross, and that our our vocation as uh, as Christians is to actually join God in mending the divides. And, and that anything anything outside of that work is not Christian faithfulness. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, and it, 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 as I, I, I imagine you would agree, you know, that the tradition of American Christians is not that of peacemakers. Mm-hmm. It, it's not that of people who actively move into the divides to see it mended. It, it tends to be a group of people who have a particular agenda, who endorse revenge, who are okay with the use of violence, regardless of what that does. The main objective seems to be our own safety, maybe our own sense of morality, and then we're going to go to be be in heaven with Jesus the rest of our life. Mm-hmm. That's just not Christian faithfulness, and theologically it's inaccurate. So let's bring this back to something really local in Bend, Oregon, where you're from. So for most people, you know, our interpretation of Oregon is Portland, right? And you know, Bend or Oregon is not Portland. If uh, you you kind of get out of that 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 particular city. So in 2018, we're expecting that in the state, um, we're going to see a ballot initiative that's going to focus on barring sanctuary cities, whatever that means, right? Whatever a sanctuary city is. So as you were doing your work and you look ahead to a really uh, you know, a very polarized environment at a very local level on this particular issue, question of immigrants and immigration. How do you see, how do you see 2018 unfolding for the Global Immersion Project in Bend? Um, and how do you, how do you navigate that, that environment? Yeah, I, I, I'm very hopeful about 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bend is the seventh fastest growing city in the country right now. Wow. And so there's an insurgence of people who are moving to Bend who have a bit more of a progressive justice oriented bent to them which which is exciting but what's happened in uh, kind of uh, behind the scenes over the last 18 months is that i've been working with the faith communities there there's now an alliance of about 28 local faith communities where we've been simply doing the work of education and awareness and friend making so for 18 months we've been just tilling the soil on this particular issue because in Bend, while we're right now a city of about 100,000, we've got 12,000 migrants, 6,000 are undocumented, and we've got about 3,000 dreamers. And so this is in, in this is still rural. While we're the seventh fastest growing city, this is still rural America, yeah. right? This is the epicenter of Bend. Uh, and in, or excuse me, of Oregon, and Bend is isolated from anything else, mm-hmm. right? And so that makes our migrant population the most vulnerable. Right. So our strategy has been to work within the context of the faith communities, and I'm talking about the interfaith network, to begin to build an alliance that's built upon education, awareness, and friend making. And and it's in that it's in the work that we've been doing for 18 months that um, that resulted in yesterday, while I'm in Representative Walden's office, calling on him to lead the way for lasting, uh, timely legislation on behalf of our dreamers. There were 2,000 people in the streets of Bend, people of faith, and these are not like your legacy activist folks Mm -hmm. showing up. These are like your your Anglo Sunday morning church people Mm -hmm. standing in the streets of Bend during lunch hour on a Wednesday with signs saying, we are for our dreamers, our dreamers are our future. Mm 
right? And they're not just saying that because of the education and awareness. They're saying that because they're now in relationship with these young heroes um, in, in our area. And so in Bend, we've moved beyond the conversation around sanctuary because it's become so polarizing yeah. in, in Central Oregon. Um, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, we were declared a welcoming city, which is a huge moment of momentum in the right direction for a city like Bend that has been very white, very wealthy, and very conservative. Yeah. So the, the, the ne- we're watching in 18 months, we're watching the needle move on this issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it seems as though dreamers are, um, you know, are, are really the issue that people become most sympathetic about and, yeah. and are invested in. Yeah. Thank you very much for the time. So, uh, Mending the Divides, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming out to DC and doing some visits. You bet. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Jer Swigert is the co-founder of the Global Immersion Project. His book, written with co-founder John Huckins, is called Mending the Divides, Creative Love in a Conflicted World. You can find out more about him, the book, and the project at our website, immigrationforum.org. That's all for now. Thanks, as always, to our producers, Emily Chow and Megan Wetmore, and executive producer Kathleen Farrell. Only in America comes from the National Immigration Forum. I'm Ali Narani. Talk to you next week.